Welcome to Halting Towards Ion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land to talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew. And today we're wrapping up our series on Deuteronomy and talking about the metaphysics of Christian education. When we started this podcast 60 episodes ago or however many it's been, we started considering things from Genesis, who God is, how Christian ontology or metaphysics is different from every other world system. That is, when we ask the question, what's real? How do we know? What's the nature of that reality? How does it communicate to us? The Bible's answer is unique. It, there's no other religion that comes close, that kind of parallels. It's a watered-down version. Because Christianity starts within the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Every other system starts with stuff is, and stuff develops, mm -hmm. and we're left with stuff. Now, if you're a materialist, the stuff may be atoms, particles, subatomic particles, quarks, energy particles, if you want to fudge what materialism means. Mm -hmm. If you're uh, a pantheist, the stuff is spirit divinity, something that is obviously not matter because we're not calling it that, so it's not. But the problem is, in both cases, all there is is whatever it is. It's all matter or it's all spirit. And there really is nothing against which to compare it or judge it because all is all. Now, it is theoretically possible to hold some kind of uh, merger of the two. New Age mysticism tried this back a little ways. You can think of Star Wars here, the original, the only one. New, <laughs> New Hope, it's slenderously called, um, <laughs> where the force is this energy field created by all living creatures, where God and the universe are interactive and one projecting the other. But it doesn't last very long. We, we can have hokey religions and good blasters, and yet somehow it may sell a lot of money in the movie theaters but no one sustains it very long. And so we keep defaulting one direction or the other. The deity becomes simply energy, which becomes matter, or the matter becomes a manifestation of being. You're stuck with some stuff. Christianity is the one religion that says there's God. And then there's the stuff he made, and then there's no mixture between the two. God does not blend into his creation. It does not blend into him. He is he, it is it. Man, therefore, does not become God, cannot become God, not by increasing his power, knowledge, intuition, spirituality, you name it. There's nothing that man can do to climb the ladder of being into deity. God became man exactly once in the person of Jesus Christ. And even there, there is no confusion between that which is divine and that which is human created mortal. One altogether, not by confusion of nature, but by union of person, the Athanasian Creed says. So if in Jesus Christ, who is God and who is man, even there, if these lines are not blurred, then we can say for, for all aspects of reality and all of our interactions with God, he's God and we're not. Now, that has implications for, we, we've talked about sociology, we've talked about politics, we're ending here sort of with a focus on education, but it wraps all of this all together. What does this understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is, how does that feed into a Christian understanding of education? And let's contrast that with, what if all stuff is stuff, then what do people do with that stuff when it comes to education? Why do they educate? And what's their goal? And what's the danger of all the rest of us? So that's kind of what we're looking at. I don't remember if we still left it in, but at some point we're going to talk about the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. So the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the unity of deity without mixture. And Moses, in, in explaining this, moves right into there's one God. you got to love him with all your being. We can talk about why those two are necessary corollaries. And loving him with all your being means you take his words and you teach them to your kids with some goals in mind. The other question we have to ask is, okay, well, if you're not 
a Christian, you don't believe any of that. What exactly are our schools doing? And do we really trust them? So there's, I hope that's more or less what we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you just quoted Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through six, six, seven. I bl I stopped it. I stopped in the middle of seven. <laughs> okay. But we could go on and say, and you're going to talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you're going to buy them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be as frontlets between thy eyes. You shall write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So this this teaching of God's words is not a haphazard affair. It's not something you do on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights or at devotions. Um, around the dinner table now and then. It's a, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you got your kid there, you're supposed to be talking. One, teaching them, there's two things here, teaching them the very words of God and then talking about what those words mean. I think there's something contexts. even before that. Yeah, what's These that? These are your children. Yes. <laughs> you have children. You have children. Wow. Yes, you do. Because it's kind of goes back to Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so I'm fond of telling which my students at school, have children, have children, have children. I, th I think I think he wants us to have children. And yes, we know all of the, but there are these exceptions, sure. But that's, we're not talking about exceptions, we're talking about the general Humanity command. as a whole. Humanity as a whole uh, is supposed to replicate, uh, covenantally reproduce, evangelistically reproduce, so that the earth is full of lots of godly people who together are loving God and therefore loving one another and serving one another and together are carrying out this great project of coming to know God better. And in almost in a nutshell, there's Christian education. Uh, God has said, has given us this planet and said, it's cool, make it cooler. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a group project. And in order for it to work, you have to love each other because if you're cheating, killing each other all the time, it's not, you're not going to get there very well or very fast. And you need to do it out of love for me. So this is not just for what feels good, what's in it for you, but it's going to require lots and lots of people. And, and in order for this to happen, you need to know my words. This is the owner's manual. And then you talk about them because although the words are sufficient the way they come for what God intended, God also intends that they be the means of communication, fellowship, and instruction, help and aid to one another. You see something in them that I don't see. I see something she doesn't see. She, and we keep passing back and forth. The uh, Apostle Paul in Ephesians um, 4 uses the image of the body, which having been taught by uh, pastors, teachers, apostles, prophets, then takes this truth in love and keeps passing it back from one, we would say, cell to another, one joint to another, so that the whole body grows together. And in the process of growing, it's doing stuff. A body that just sits on a table and grows by itself yeah. is kind of <laughs> a creepy thing. Yeah. It, it needs to be out there doing what it was told to do, but doing it in harmony, in unison, in uh, reciprocity, building building itself up as we glorify God in all this wonderful world that he's given us. So that's, that's and, and for this to happen, we each have our own kids, and we're supposed to teach them, first of all and primarily, ourselves. Now, there's a danger. Okay, so it's just my kids, so you can't tell them anything. I have seen that mentality. That's a mistake. We all belong to the body of Christ, and um, we need to be very open, I believe, to having other Christians feed into their lives. This is part of the philosophy of having Christian schools. I'm, I'm all for homeschooling, but just as there can be weird Christian schools, there can be weird homeschools. <laughs> And one I, of them I thought it was a prerequisite <laughs> of homeschooling to be weird. It used to be. Back <laughs> when I was a homeschooler, it was a prerequisite. Lots of normal kids homeschool now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any, no, please, no letters on that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is important, since we are all members of the body of Christ, and that includes our kids, our covenant children, that we let other Christians speak into their lives. Now, whether you do that at Sunday school, in open discussion, fellowship after church, before church, in the church session, uh, at home, uh, on weekends, in some kind of, um, I forget what they're called, when homeschooling families get together and... Co-ops. Co-ops. I could not come up with that word to save me. But the, the attitude that, no, they're, I'm going to reproduce myself in them 
exactly is frightening because I know as a sinner that I don't want me reproduced exactly in my kids. That's frightening. And so I need others to balance out the weaknesses and the sins in my own Christian life, in my children. And so although I am first of all accountable to God for my own children, there is a general accountability. I don't know how they do it in your churches. In ours, we actually, in the baptismal vows, take a vow that we will aid in the spiritual nourishment of these children. The whole congregation. The whole congregation. Yeah. 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 And so this is having said this, I, I think I just summed up what Christian education is without really intending it. But I think it becomes clearer when we now turn and look at those other philosophies that maintain a philosophy of continuity of being all is one, all stuff is stuff. It's all the same stuff, which means there's nothing above it to criticize or to which we might appeal for absolutes, for direction. Matter is matter is matter, then matter does what matter does. And then we start looking at what matter does, and any degree of honesty, although there's nothing in the nature of matter that requires honesty or even recommends it, would would show us that people are selfish. People like to accumulate to themselves wealth and fame and power and pleasure. And that even those who set about doing good often define that good in terms of their what makes them happy, what they see is the best for everyone. And they, they tend to want to reshape other people in their own image, whether it's something as, as small as um, you need to eat like I eat, or you need to live where I live, or you need to dress like I dress, or you need to read the books I'm reading. Or something as extreme as, and every thought that you have should be an echo of mine because I will henceforth be the source of truth. Whether it's materialism or whether it's mysticism that says that, doesn't matter. You're, you're recreating the future. Children. Children, 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 children. You're recreating the future in your image. And you can say, well, there's nothing that requires that. No, but there's nothing that forbids it. And Again, observation suggests that we are selfish beings, and we do that. Now, as Christians, we know exactly why we do that. We all want to play God. But there's nothing within those systems, whether it be pantheism or materialism, that can stand up and say, but wait, this desire to play God and to recreate the world in your image is wrong. Because what is wrong? Charles Manson, the serial killer, or the mass murderer, I guess, um, said, if God is one, what is wrong? He understood. If if everything is one, if there is nothing transcendent, nothing above and outside of our reality to which we can appeal, then we got we got we have no appeal. We have no help. We have nothing to to stand against the I want of the collective id other than our own I want. Well, I, you want that, I want this. It's great. Now we got war. Now we have Hegelian synthesis. We have fighting within the unity, but ultimately there can't be anything. There can be no line of demarcation except the momentary surging of the current. And sooner or later, this process of change and development is going to take us in the same direction because there's nothing else to appeal to. To what degree are we using the words discipleship and education interchangeably? And how far are those equal things? Um, Because someone could say, well, yeah, I want to disciple my children, but I send them to school for reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, How do we apply this properly and with wisdom to the task of a school in education as we think of it as this localized thing? Well, I think the answer lies in what we've already spoken of. We have a word from God, God who is is triune, the Father uh, from eternity uh, speaking the divine word, um, begetting his only begotten Son, the Father and Son breathing forth to each other. God is self-communicating, God is self-revealing, and God has revealed to us, created man in such a way that God can reveal himself using words. And since God spoke the word, and the word is with God and is God. Because words 
tremendous significance within, within Christian thought and life. Uh, God's given us this word called the Bible that contains many words connected by normal uh, grammar and syntax with normal literary devices, whereby he tells us how we, what our task is, how we should then live, what we should do, what we should value, what's important. And in, in a broader sense, and to what sphere of life, what, to what covenant institution certain things belong. Parents, as we said earlier, are responsible for the kids. They may get together and create a school, or someone may offer the services of school. They can say, yeah, well, okay, we're going to send our kids to school. But the parents don't give up being parents, nor do they give up the obligation, covenant obligations before God to oversee the education and training of their children. And so when the school, whether it be run by church or state or some cultic leader, says, and we're going to be programming your children to think in such and such a way, we don't have the right to say, oh, you are the educators, you know more than we do, please take our children. We have the obligation to say, no, uh, I answer before God, you're not going to teach my kid those things. But it's for the good of society. No, you're a troublemaker. Yeah, sure I am. But, and here's the thing. I'm standing on a reference point that exists outside of creation. I'm standing yeah. upon <laughs> what the was so this good of society. You yeah, yeah. This, you're, you're talking about this good of society. I'm talking about the God who made the universe, who stands outside the universe and speaks into the universe. And he has said in his word, these things, and you're contradicting these things. I get to say no. And one day, whether you take my no or not, whether you kill me for it or try to uh, put me in a labor camp or whatever, you will stand before a God who will hold you accountable and I will be justified and declared right because I'm doing what he said. And there's an absolute standard that goes way beyond anything you're, you, any, any manipulation words you want to use. And I think it's important in this era, in, in American history, world history too, to realize to what degree the other side is borrowing Christian language and Christian assumptions thinly veiled. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to accept one another. We're supposed to be interested in humanity, the good of humanity, the good, the future, the good of the planet, all of these things. The, the pagan world never suggested any of these things. Um, and uh, Brian, your uh, your favorite author, um, Spider-Man. Tom Holland. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Spider-Man. Tom Holland in his book Dominion, which I'm only halfway through, but it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, spends a lot of time showing that the pagan world never came up with any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Ju in fact, Julian the Apostate, I just got through his section, was uh, was amazed because it's, you know, I'm here at this great temple to the pagan goddess, and you you priests are not taking care of the poor, and you're not <laughs> looking after the oppressed. You're not doing that. Well, that's what she. That's, so like, since when is that my job? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly how the priest that he Julian walks away. The priest is saying, "What are you talking about?" And he's claiming, oh, this is what the Iliad and the Odyssey were all about. The priests are saying, what? <laughs> no. No, it was and, not. <laughs> <laughs> Julian was very disappointed because pagans weren't living like Christians, but he didn't understand that that's what he was saying. He had picked up enough of the Christian worldview to say, these are good things. He just didn't want the God of the universe telling him these things. He didn't want Jesus of Nazareth saying, you do this and you do it through my blood. He thought we should, we're all good. We should all be doing these things because it's obvious we should do these things. Right? Isn't it obvious? Mm. And we're at a point in our history where people are still using the, the broad phrases of love and compassion and acceptance and tolerance, drained of all Christian meaning, with their own ideas put in to move along their own particular agenda, which is basically world control. Have you uh, seen the movie The Book of Eli? No, my wife has. She said it was really good. It's yeah, very good. You should it was watch it. It acknowledges the power of the words of scripture in a very interesting way. Indeed. And it's probably no surprise to you, although I will spoiler tag for Dominion. No. <laughs> um, towards it's the end of the book. It's a history book. book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, towards the end of the book, he actually explicitly draws that line to um, things like the modern liberalism movement mm. and how they're, they've basically yoinked a whole bunch of Christian ideas and have, I don't think he puts it in this way, but you know, they, they've gutted them of their spiritual import. And I'm just right. trying to take these external things that they've recognized, oddly enough, are good. Yeah. And trying to do that. And, and they have a very 
he I think he calls it puritanical, which you know is a loaded phrase beyond all recognition. But yes. <laughs> uh, the puritanical, in common understanding, uh, motivation to try to purify society right. and make everyone align with your worldview and values. Yeah, I think there are two things. Go- Thank you. That's excellent. I think there are two things going on here. One is they can't escape their Christian roots any more than Julian Apostate could. They've they've been programmed to 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 use these connotation words, even when they hate them. They still keep falling back on love, acceptance, tolerance, and such. But the other thing is that they have learned that everyone else falls back on them too, and therefore they are very useful. Francis Schaeffer spoke of them as connotation words. Where you you speak of the gospel and salvation and the resurrection power of Christ, and you'd ha- they have no theological content, but people still respond to the idea of new life, of resurrection. Well, I mean, you can see that in Jungian um, psychology yeah. um, as well, where it's you know they use all those those same right. kind of connotation words, but you know it, it's the the word brings the spirit. The logos shows up a yeah. whole lot in what Jordan Peterson says. He's a Jungian through and through. Doesn't mean what yeah. we mean by it. Yeah, those words do not mean what you think they mean. You know, it, it was. Um, I think it was Henry. I thought it was Chesterton or Lewis, but now apparently I'm, I'm finding it's uh, Henry David Thoreau who said, "If I knew that someone was deliberately coming to do me good, I would run as fast as I can in the opposite direction." Well, why is that? Because what's really happening is that somebody thinks that they know what's best for you and that they are going to control you in order to remake you in their image. Mm. But you can't say that. I want to control you and make you a little, uh, uh, what's the word? robot. Yeah. (laughs) Mini-me. Projection of my, project. yeah, mini-me, a projection of myself. You can't say that. So what you have to say is, but I love you and I want what's best for you. Reagan had the phrase, the 10 most terrifying words in the English language, I'm here from the government, and I'm here to help. Oh, yes, exactly. And, and so that's, that's what we're seeing. What, what are we left with when all stuff is stuff and there's no appeal beyond the stuff? We're left with that mentality because Christianity is true. We keep thinking that way. We think in terms of sin and redemption. We think in terms of of creator and creation. We think in terms of sanctification and change. We think in terms of resurrection life, but we so gut it because we've got nothing to appeal to beyond the stuff. And so it, we use these connotation words, we use these ideas and these motifs. And yet ultimately what it comes down to is that the people in charge simply have their own preferences for whatever reason, wherever they came from, and they want to conform the rest of us to those preferences. And more often than not, it has a lot to do, um, George Orwell would say, with the lust for power, the lust to control, to hurt, destroy, because what else is there? Others might be a little less op- pessimistic or pessimistic than, than Orwell, but it, it doesn't matter. Uh, Lewis addresses this in The Abolition of Man. You know, what happens when we have so transcended nature that nothing's natural, even our impulses, even our motivations? He says, well, do you, you think that the manipulators, the controllers, the educators will be such bad people? No, they won't be people at all in our sense of the word because they'll now be beyond good and evil. They will do what they do, not because of any absolute, but simply because they want to. And, you know, when everything else has fallen, you ought to goes away with Christianity. I want to remains. Mm. And what they want is what they want. And there's no appeal beyond that. And that's what Lewis warned us. That's what Orwell and Huxley warned us of, and uh, Ray Bradbury, uh, Fahrenheit 451. What happens when the controllers have nothing left to restrain them, not even conscience? You know, we talk, we talk about the Inquisition. The Inquisitor at least believes there's a God out there and he's doing God's service. The drunken feudal lord may at least pass out and leave you alone for a little while or go fight his war. But these people want to control everything. They want to do us good, and they are from the government or from the local school system or the local social worker, and they want to help us. And what response do we have? Well, as Christians, we have a lot to say because we can appeal to a God and to a risen Lord who exists outside of that because our risen Lord is also God and yet exists within it because he's also human 
And so it's not a, an otherworldly mysticism where we abandon this world. He came into our world, Lewis says in one place, he took to himself a body of dust and made it glorious forever. So the, the truth of the incarnation and the resurrection establishes that the world's important. It's just not God. Lewis has that other quote. I can never remember which book of his it's in, but about a, a society of tyrannical, absolute moral busybodies. Yeah. And, you know, he says the, and it's like what you said, you know, the robber baron, he may get tired. And right. yeah, I was, the I was, thief may be glutted uh, by his spoils, but the person who thinks he's he's really doing this, he's punishing you for your own good, will not rest because he has the the unfailing support of his own conscience on his side. Yeah, that's a quote from. I was kind of paraphrasing that, although I couldn't remember where it came yeah. from at the time. But it's his um, commentary either on psychology or sociology that I actually mm. do quote someplace somewhere. I could say right. being in his psychology. Oh, I know what it was. It was in um, his discussion of the death penalty, or no, uh, not death penalty, but um, punishment, punishment versus um, rehabilitation. Oh, because he he said, you know, if you're, do we really want to surrender our life to people whose job is to rehabilitate us? What does that look like, and when are they done? Yes. And 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 am I stuck? You know, if I if I serve jail time. When my time's up, I'm free and it's done. I'm gone. But if I'm not, but if I'm sick, then I'm not done until I'm well. Who decides? And by what standard? And what if I never agreed to that standard? Mm -hmm. Humanitarian theory. And, of and remember, of course, from a, a human standpoint, like the secular standpoint, the only thing that makes your suffering justified versus mm -hmm you're suffering magically, even though you're doing undergoing the same things with the same motivations, the only thing that changes it from being unjust to just is whether or not the majority of human beings hold to one side or the other. Yeah. Or if they don't know. <laughs> or if they don't know. <laughs> because that we know, too. Yeah, we know better. And eventually everyone will come to see it from our point of view because our descendants will write the history books. Oh, dear. <laughs> Well, you know, assuming they have descendants in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Well, by the time we brainwash everybody, everyone will be our children. No, oh, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, my, my thought patterns go rather dark, not because I believe it will happen, but because I believe if God didn't restrain us, that's exactly where we would go. Sure. That's where self-consistency leads. But God doesn't let us be self-consistent because he's got a better story to tell. Yeah. So let's dig a little bit more into the Shema, the extended Shema. Um, what are all of these things that it's talking about? Find these things as frontlets between your eyes, etc. Well, first of all, Shema is the Hebrew word for oh here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, or the Lord our God is one Jehovah, or the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The idea is the unity of the Godhead. Uh, not first that there is only one God. But second, that this God is one. The theologians speak of his simplicity. That is, he does not come in bits and pieces, pieces and parts. This is an important concept in our age because we tend to think of, well, God's mostly love, but maybe he has a little justice in there. Well, well why can't God forbear on that whole justice thing? I mean, he's God. Can't he just ditch the justice and just show love? No, you're not understanding the nature of God. God is... He's, he's uh, not Mr. Potato Head. Exactly. He's not <laughs> Mr. Potato Head. There you go. He's identical with his attributes. He is truth. He is love. He is justice. He is humor. He is creativity. He's holiness. He's purity. And, and so as we come to consider God, we consider not some part of God and let that dominate our thinking. We consider God as God in all that he reveals himself. And thus, first of all, then the necessity... That we love God with all our heart. We, we, we're not to chase different gods. My mind will follow uh, Reformed Calvinistic Christianity. My heart will go with um, mystical Hinduism, and my will will go with some kind of reform movement born out of the 1840s. It's, our heart needs to be united on the one being who is God, who is himself not divided. I don't have to choose and pick among God's attributes to make up some kind of designer form of Christianity or some smorgasbord approach as to who God is and what therefore should be important to me. I need to love God, with the one God who is one with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind and strength, the, the, our Lord in the New Testament, 
and juggles the words around a bit to to achieve emphasis. But might means physical energies, the energies of my body. This is not just an intellectual thing. It's not just emotional. It's not just spiritual in some Platonic sense. But it's me as a person. I have to love God with all that I am, because there's only one God. And and once and and I need to love Him with my heart. And again, that's not just the emotions. That's the religious center of my being, the place where my values are written, where where I stand before absolutes and bow, where I say, this is what's true and right, and I will not be moved from it. That part, uh, the I that says me, with that, I am, to, I am to love God, and nothing else is to intrude there. I can't serve two masters or worship two or three different gods. Uh, and that, that said then, these words which I command thee this day. God speaks to us in words. He does not say, this word which I command you, oh, well, that would be true enough. But he says words. He's talking grammatically. There are specific nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, pronouns, uh, interjections, and conjunctions that God weaves together through the normal syntax and grammar that is Hebrew, and later on Greek, to communicate to us what Schaefer would call true truth. That is, God means something, and he effectively communicates it through words the way we do to one another, except that he gets a right. Mm -hmm. He doesn't screw it up. There's nothing, there's, because his, of his over, uh, um, overseeing providence, he doesn't lose anything, literally in translation, let alone in just trans transmission or transition from one person to another. And so we know what he says, and the words mean true things. It's not God talk or, or nonsense words. Uh, it's not uh, jabberwock. Uh, it's not connotation words, as we were talking about earlier. Th these words actually mean something. And so we are to put the words together the way he gave them to us and compare the words, compare the sentences, the propositions. He says, uh, these words which I commend you this day. These words were given at a particular time in earth's history under particular historical conditions, and they speak to us now in particular historical conditions. And, and so with all of Scripture, we need to say, okay, who was writing this? When did they live? Under what, what continent? What country? Under what ruler? What's he talking about? Who's his audience? Uh, when he when he says this thing was a cubit long, do we know what a cubit is? Well, that's how long it was. When he says six days, he means six days. He's he's writing in terms of a historical framework, and he expects us to understand that. These words which I commend you this day shall be in thine heart. We've talked about that, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. It's not again a haphazard. We communicate this somehow along the way by accident. Cultural transmission. Using words if necessary. <laughs> yeah, using words as we go. How about these pictures? Won't this? No. Because we're, we're talking about words. Now, if, you, if your kid has never seen a sheep, fine, draw a sheep. But better yet, go find one and say, sheep. Or draw a box, which has a sheep in it. <laughs> Sorry, little go. prince of words. <laughs> um, teach them diligently to your children, first of all. And you still talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. The point is at all times during the day, when you, time you get up, you go to bed at night, you're walking along the way to the store, to the pasture, or wherever you're going with your kids. It's not just in some specialized religious setting where you do this, or even some special educational setting. This is going to be an ongoing, all the time kind of thing. But my wife was great with this. When our, when our girls were little, she'd just take them outside and they'd come upon a rose and she'd say, oh, look at this great, this beautiful rose that God made for us. And some people might think, well, no, that, that's over the top. You're, you're, you're religious. So contrived. Yeah, so, that's the word. You're so contrived. No, it actually, God actually did make it and he actually did put it there. And one of the prime reasons he put it there was for us, since he sees it, the angels see it, probably nobody in our family will ever see it. Then we're part of the audience and there's nothing contrived about it. You, you're you getting your kids to understand this is our father's world. And that's one of the implications of this. You're not having to get religious. You know, all right, child, be still and wonder at the power of our sovereign God in making this rose for us here and now. Bless the rose, my child. And you don't, no, it's just like, oh, a pretty, pretty rose that, uh, that God made for us. One of the real things... <laughs> Well, I think it's really bad about Christian school teachers and Sunday school teachers and pastors and sometimes parents is that holy voice you take on when you start talking about <laughs> the things that sounds sort of like Vincent Price from a horror movie. Um, it's just ordinary language. You should be able to shift in and out of 
talking about God with talking about anything, plumbing or your cat needing to be neutered or papaya pills I see on my desk, whatever you're talking about, <laughs> old friendships, old memories. Because he made it all. He made it all, and it's all yeah. part of what he has for us to do here, mm -hmm. from dominion over the lesser creatures to taking care of our health with papaya to uh, one anothering each other, as Paul tells us so many times. All, all of those things have direct roots back to Scripture almost immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our kids need to understand this. When Christianity is something that only happens on church, even if you multiply church hours so that you're in church every night for three hours, they still get the idea that church is one thing, Christianity is one thing, and ordinary life is something else. And that's exactly what this is not saying. It's the, the Word of God oversees and informs everything. And we can yeah. always talk about it without stretching, without having to reach for it. Yeah. And then thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. The Pharisees took this literally. They designed the little phylacteries, little leather pouches they hung uh, across their foreheads and upon their hands with little specific pieces of scripture in it. Now, Jesus talked about the phylacteries. He didn't say there's anything wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with putting Bible verses up all over the place or even on your car. Even plastering them on your car if you feel like it, I guess. But that's that in itself does not make you holier, although it may give you more chances to see the word of God and be reminded of it. But that's superficial. What Jesus complained about was he actually did complain about when they made their phylactery super large, like kind of <laughs> bonk, bonk people as you bounce around with them. But that's not what he's talking about. He's used the same language earlier with regard to Passover. And you don't wear a feast on your head or on your hand. He's talking about what's uh in your before your eyes and in your head. What's in and the what's, front of your mind? What's in the front of your mind and what your hands are doing. When we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we see the beast marks his followers with a mark on their hand. He wants to control their doings. It's, it's Satan's version of this. But, I'm glad you brought that up because I was I was sitting on that. Like, I don't know who I heard that from, but there's a, <laughs> there's a connection. Well, there's a connection, yeah. It's super fun if you ever have an hour that you don't know what to do with. Get uh, Strong's Concordance and look up all the instances of foreheads in the Bible. The word forehead, oh yeah, and you will learn so much about the nature <laughs> of allegiance and loyalty, and mm -hmm. it's a pretty neat, random thing to do. On the priest's forehead was the plaque that says "Holiness to the Lord." On Adam's forehead was sweat, a sign of the curse, and Jesus' forehead is blood from the crown. And yes, many things that that mark our foreheads, that mark the front of our thinking, as you said. Well, the Shema, or the part we're concerned with at least, ends with, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and of thy gates. Now that comes later. It comes at the end. It's easy to forget it. It's not where the emphasis falls. But the post of thy house means it marks all of family life. So it's not, and I, I say this someplace, it's Christianity, uh, covenantal Christianity or having a Christian home doesn't just mean you have a home where Christians live where they live out their own private devotional life, just me and God, thank you very much. But it is a community where we sharpen one another, help one another, bless one another, encourage one another, love one another. Uh, it's, it's, it is, again, a community and group project. Uh, and the household, the house should have some kind of focus in every house its own because we're all different. But the ultimate uh, goal is the glory of God. And then lastly, upon the gates, the gates of the city. And we get there last. Some Christians are in a hurry to get there first. Let's let's make all kinds of, of good biblical laws. Well, there's nothing wrong with good biblical laws as such, but that's never the emphasis upon Scripture. We start by reaching the hearts of people. And yeah, if some of them are kings and legislatures, that's, that's wonderful, or Supreme Court justices, or presidents of the United States. But from the bottom to the top, from the inside to the outside, that's the biblical model. We start with our own hearts and then to our kids and to our homes and to our cities and communities, our neighborhood, because that's within our reach. We really, most of us don't have the ability to go to Washington and help hold a Bible study or evangelism service for 50 senators or a couple hundred representatives or half a dozen Supreme Court judges, let alone can we reach into their hearts and, and write God's law there. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And yet the law of God and the whole revelation of God in Christ does have social and civil and political application, judicial application. And to, uh, to uh, call upon Jordan Peterson again, <laughs> <laughs> he always 
says don't underestimate yourself as the center of a network. Yeah. I mean, center, frame of reference, we can talk about that. But you know a thousand people, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. Those thousand people each know a thousand people. So if the spirit of God is working in you, he can absolutely work through you in a thousand people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the philosophy behind this podcast. We're, we are thankful for anyone God lets us reach. But at least one of my hopes is that they'll tell a friend, and then they'll tell a friend, and then they'll tell a friend, and they don't even have to put us back to the, top, the podcast. As people make the Word of God the center of their life, and we, we help a little bit along the way, then we hope that the seed we sow here will have profound effects eventually. It may be echoes of echoes of echoes, and no one may ever trace it back to us but God himself. But if we were allowed to be used, then we thank God. Mm -hmm. To also point it back to Jordan Peterson, everyone, and I, I, in Christian circles, I kind of, let's blame it on the second great awakening, because why not? <laughs> uh, everyone, everyone thinks, let's, let's go out and do something big. Right. And that will change the world. Right. And, you know, maybe subconsciously there's a, like a little, and God, God will be happy with me because I did that for him. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, even, even without that, there's, there's the idea you need to go out and do something big because that's the only way mm -hmm. that there's any hope. You're not that important. Yeah. First. <laughs> Second of all, he always says, you know, people want to go out and they want to change the world. They want to do something big. They want to change society or, you know, to institute communism. And <laughs> they, you know, presumably in their own minds, they want to be in charge of that. They want to have some kind of role. Mm -hmm. But they haven't even cleaned their own room. Right. You need to start where you're at and have an effect on where you're at before you can even move to your immediate location right. and your connections. And these um, words which I command you this day shall be in thine heart. Thine heart. Starts exactly. with each of us. Yeah. And, when and the that's uncomfortable. <laughs> of the heart and the breath in the lungs is a gift from God. Right. Everything that flows out, we would be so incredibly arrogant to say, oh, yeah, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wasn't I cool today? Didn't I do God a favor? Yeah. No, you really didn't. But, but again, we if you, did if you miracles to use us, and cool. cast out demons in your yeah. name. We did, we did <laughs> cool stuff for you. Rejoice not in this, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven, which is sovereign grace. All right. We should wrap up there. Yeah. Um, we're not doing recommendations today. I, I hope you, yeah. <laughs> say it with me. Um, um, instead, we have some housekeeping details to let you, our listeners, know. We are taking a little bit of a break in the next few months, but we'll be back soon. And we're not going to leave you hanging. Uh, we're going to release bi-weekly episodes instead of every single week until July, and then we'll be back because we just finished the series on Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy just finished the series on the Torah. So we will be back with the former prophets. Is that what we're calling the next That's book? what yeah. it is, former prophets. Right. So that'll be in July and we'll be back to every single week at that point, Lord willing. Lord willing. Uh, if they're the former meantime, prophets, what are they now? The histories. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to the latter prophets. I know. Form, a, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Joke. <laughs> I thought you were being serious. You didn't no. have your normal. <laughs> you didn't have your sarcastic face on. Yeah. Oh, that that's the key to good sarcasm is to yeah. not yeah. let people onto it. Yeah. So since since we're uh, we're taking a break between Deuteronomy and Joshua, this is a great time to send us emails with questions. We're going to have a few special episodes to. Uh, we're not going to leave you with nothing. Um, so this is a great time to send us emails. Any questions you have, I'll put a post up on our Facebook page as well. So if you're not listening to this in real time, you are catching up on old <laughs> episodes. You can still know that this is a great time to send us questions about those old episodes. You can have questions about anything we've said or things we've left unsaid or things you think we should say. Just send us a lot of emails. We'll have a mailbag episode or two. Um, I think I have persuaded David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband, to actually host one of the special episodes, huh. um, which will be yes. fun and exciting. Yeah. Invite your friends to listen. Yeah, invite your friends to listen. Another way to 
share our podcast is on Facebook. You can like our Facebook page. Leave us a review. We currently have zero reviews on Facebook. We've got several five-star reviews on podcast catchers, which is great. Keep that up. We appreciate that. Um, But you can also leave us a review on Facebook. That would be fun. You can send those emails. I didn't tell you where to send the emails. I'm sorry. I'm droning on forever and ever, but I have to tell you where to send the emails. That's haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. See you in two weeks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>